Joel here with David Gilmore today. And uh, David, you're a real inspiration to us. You're the guitar guy. You're the builder. You, you're a luthier. You've been doing this for a long time. You're an entrepreneur. I yeah. And I love stories about entrepreneurs. And I'm curious to know how, how this evolved for you. Uh, well, I started building in 1995, but uh, I've had a guitar in my hand, you know, since before I could walk. I remember my mom had a guitar and I used to hold it like it was an upright <laughs> bass because it was so large. So a guitar has been, you know, an everyday thing for me since, for as long as I can remember. And uh, as far as building guitars, uh, uh, I don't know if you remember, you might be old enough to remember, uh, the, there was a, a, the Alan Hamill show on CTV. It was uh, a daily talk show. <laughs> so, so Alan Hamill had uh, Valdeon as a guest oh. and he had a, gu a guitar uh, on the chair beside him. And Alan Hamill says, so tell me what's the deal with this guitar? And Valdi goes, my friend Jean Larivet built this guitar. And it was at that time, I might have been 15 or 16 years old, and I went, wait a second. Somebody built a guitar. Hmm. <laughs> One day, I'm going to build a guitar. Wow. So fast forward to 1995, you know, I take a course and learn how to build guitars. And, and then 2011, I opened up Gilmore Guitars full time. Yeah. So it's... In the process, did you ever hit that point where you felt like, I've hit the wall, there's nothing I can do? And no, how did you handle that? Or did I, you, are, I, you, are you like no other entrepreneur that that never happened? Well, when I opened the shop, my wife and I, we wrote and rewrote the business plan yeah. for, for opening the shop. So when we opened it, May 1st, 2011, we opened it without a plan B. So uh, failure wasn't an option. Nice, nice. So that's why, you know, over 10 years later, we're yeah. still here. Uh, has the business grown like the business plan suggested it might? No, but I think the fact that I'm still here 10 yeah. years in and still open, I, I think is a success yeah. for yeah. any small business. 10 years in, yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's been about the time we did started at the ranch. I right, yeah. yeah. Cool, because I think one of the, one of the things that has kept us going was, was we had a 10 year vision. Right. We didn't have the plan at the beginning, but it was like in 10 years, we want to be doing this and this and this and this. Right. And it just evolved for us. And I think you're, yeah, yeah. You, but you had a pretty solid plan. We, so had, you, we had a plan, but you know, like any plan, you know, you know, everybody's got a good plan until they get yeah. punched in the nose. Right. So, yeah. um, it, because it's a one man shop, obviously my wife is a huge part of what we do uh, here, 100%. but, but, uh, you know, I, we can pivot. Mm -hmm. Easily because yeah. I don't have a staff that I have to worry about, you know, and that sort of stuff. So I'm a one man guy, you know, and actually uh, opening the shop, it probably wasn't until three years in till I actually got good at, at building guitars. Like I was okay. Like that first yeah. three years, the guitars were okay. Yeah. But there was a, a point at about three years where the level of craft turned a corner where mm -hmm. now uh, I'm not scared to put a guitar that I built up against anything that Taylor's got, anything nice. that Martin's doing, anything that Gibson's doing, yeah. especially from a sound and playability standpoint. Yeah, and as you progress, this confidence, yeah, this confidence is backed by the proof. The yeah. proof's in the pudding, and yeah. I can see that growing yeah. in you. That's yeah, cool. and yeah. and they still get better, and yeah. I still make huge mistakes. Yeah, you know, there's a guitar in the shop that's called the shop guitar, and the reason it's not in the showroom is because. I made mistakes, and it, yeah. it's a guitar that I didn't want to be representative of the quality of the stuff nice, that I yeah. do. So, so it's there, yeah. uh, you know. And it's you know, there's been several of those guitars in the t in the ten years, and people will come in, and you know, just jam, and they'll play the guitar, and they go, "This is a great guitar." Yeah. You know, and so I end up I sold four shop guitars in ten years. Yeah. Uh, you know, obviously not for the full yeah. pop because yeah. of the issues that they have. Uh, but you know, it's just, you know, it's, it's a quality control thing for yeah. me. Right. So and the buyer has found something that they, yeah. they're attracted to yeah. from that item. And, yeah. And, and yeah. most of the ones that have bought those guitars have been legitimate singer songwriters yeah. where, you know, they're recording and, you know, you know, they can't afford a $5,000 guitar because yeah. they're out there slogging in the bars and, and, you know, they're making you know, they're just making their monthly nut right. as it is. So yeah. when they find a guitar like this that speaks to them, you know, then yeah. 
Let's have a look at some of the pieces you've got. I just I just love walking in here. It smells good and it's cool and it's You know, just, that's one of the I want to play. the the most made observations when people walk in here is I love the smell in here. Well, then you know if they have COVID or not. <laughs> You're right, exactly. <laughs> so, so that's a test. <laughs> I never thought of that. So acoustic guitars is where I live. That's that's what I love to do the most. Uh, I mean, I, I do build solid body guitars, uh, you know, for fun. And, you know, there is obviously a market. But quite frankly, the electric guitar market is a little bit more difficult to to break than the acoustic guitar market and I don't because electric guitar guys are picky and if it ain't perfect then they, you know they a lot of them yep. tend to not or they're vintage yeah. you know if it's if it's not you know a 1968 telly then they're not interested right so so it's a really interesting market but I have a lot of fun building them yeah so and sorry yeah these two these two guitars so the end of July the last week of July uh, we lost Dusty Hill from ZZ Top, uh, and I've been a ZZ Top my entire life. And uh, actually, this guitar, when I built this one, I was channeling Dusty Hill. Uh, I actually originally had a backwards headstock on it and everything, so I was, you know, that was the inspiration for building this guitar. And I gigged this guitar uh, with uh, Super Trucker for for <laughs> probably three or four years. So this is, you know, this guitar has been around. Uh, so, as I mentioned, uh, we lost Dusty Hill, and I had this photograph that I had downloaded of uh, Dusty and Billy playing this set of guitars. Uh, John Bolin built those guitars. Uh, and I thought, you know, I, I want to build that bass. Just, I, I felt compelled to, to, to make tribute to, to Dusty Hill. So, I got uh, a couple of boards of white pine uh, from Eco Tree here in town. So, this is locally grown and harvested and kill dried uh, wood. Uh, from Eco Tree here in town. So I got this big board. I'm going, why don't I just build them both? So I built them as a set, basically from the photograph. So uh, the, 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 the guitars that they own are John Bolin, and they're called the Stoner Tellies because the finish on them actually looks like granite. But from, from mm. the photograph, they just looked kind of gray. So uh, I, I, I built them to look like that photograph. And then you can see this, uh, it's a, a mummy head, an Egyptian mummy head uh, that was actually in the photograph of uh, the Billy Gibbons guitar. So I had a, a, a friend of mine, Sue Barker, who's a great artist. Uh, I said, can you uh, just do something similar? So she told me she went looking for another picture of that guitar to blow up. She couldn't find another picture of the guitar other than the picture that I had of it. So she just, you know, Googled the Egyptian mummy head and found the actual picture that <laughs> Bolin used. Uh, so she replicated it. And then I just hand cut and filed the, uh, the long horns. So there's one there and there's one here. And uh, replicated the pick guards from them. And, the, and then MJS Pickups, he is a Canadian boutique winder. Um, he did a deep dive into the Bolin guitar as well. He says, you know, that's not just a... Uh, a straight up vintage PAF humbucker, that's kind of a, a wide range pickup. So he actually built me a pickup that's very similar to the actual pickup. Oh, cool. in. So this guitar is going to sound a lot like a Billy Gibbons Tele guitar yeah. when you plug it into a, a Marshall or something like that for sure. <laughs> cool. This guitar here uh, is kind of, I love to recycle stuff. Uh, Kathy from Long & McQuaid, who's the manager at Long & McQuaid and has been the manager for uh, 53rd Street Music. Uh, when Long & McQuaid purchased, they're doing a big renovation down there, and they had these butcher block counters. So she gave me one and said, can you cut out a couple of bodies just so I can hang on my wall? Uh, so I cut out a Strat and a Tele and a, a Les Paul for her, and I said, you know, there's enough for me to build a real guitar. So I did. <laughs> and I just finished it with some iron acetate and lemon oil so it'll, it'll patina really, really nicely. Uh, and kind of made it look like the the worn out grubby part of the counter where you know hands have been on it yep. for years and years and years. So, so again, MGS custom pickups. And the iron acetate, we've talked about this before, mm. but that the reason or what's the, what's the process? So iron what's acetate is white vinegar and mostly steel wool. You can throw nails or staples or whatever in there. So what the 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 vinegar as an acid will corrode the steel. 
So it thus an iron acetate. So what I do is I'll use a black tea that has a tannin in it. So I'll, I'll brush the, the body with a white tea and then the iron acetate and uh, it, you get that some people call it ebonizing because it turns mm -hmm. it black, that sort of stuff. And you've used so, that on some yeah, of the pieces so too. Yeah, the, so these guitars here, yeah. are um, they were part of what I called the Isolation Series. So back in uh, uh, March of 2020, when the world shut down, uh, I had built a little parlor guitar, uh, not this one, uh, and I did the Iron Acetate. And at the time, I went, I, you know, I'm going to build on a theme as long as this shutdown lasts. So I built one of each of my models of guitar, a uh, parlor, uh, model A, a standard, and then a jumbo. And then I built another uh, uh, parlor guitar afterwards. So I built till about September on the theme. So every guitar had the iron acetate treatment to the top. So this is uh, a spruce top, so it would look like this without the acetate on it. And these are just uh, close to the wood oil finish. So the finish is very thin and they call it close to the wood because it almost feels like you're touching wood, but it's, but it's very protective of the surface as well. Uh, so these are uh, mahogany, uh, Sapili mahogany. Uh, and uh, the nice thing about Sapili mahogany is it's actually a plantation wood. So it's, it's available, it's accessible, and it's a great tone wood. Is there, I mean, what's happening with the wood pricing right now? Is it all kind of, is are you noticing fluctuations in it? Or is it well, just really unpredictable? Or? In the luthier world, um, when you put the word tone in front of wood, the wood doubles or you know, triples in price anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, so specialty. It, yeah, but uh, you know, fortunately, I can I can go to Windsor Plywood, and and buy a plank and resaw. I just have to be mindful of the, the moisture content of the wood mm -hmm. to make sure that's dry and usable. So yeah. uh, at Roosters, you have a, a little maple parlor guitar in, in Canmore. Mm -hmm. That guitar was built out of a, a board that I bought at Windsor Plywood. Mm -hmm. So I, there's that. You know, I bought this Apili Mahogany from a wood wholesaler. It, it came as a big plank, so I was able to cut it up, and I built several solid body guitars out of that one plank. And I think I got, well, I have three sets of it left in my stash, and I built at least four acoustic guitars with it out of that one, that nice. one plank. So, yeah. but then, you know, I have guitars of walnut, and uh, this is uh, the Tasmanian Blackwood, where I'll purchase it from suppliers like Luthiers Mercantile out of uh, Washington. And uh, there's also uh, Timeless Instruments out of Saskatchewan that has a Luthery tone wood. Uh, online store as well. So there's tons and tons of sources to get wood, yeah. but uh, you know, I like to, I like to use and reuse. Just on body shapes too. Can you just touch on some, sure. some of the so, things? Sure. So the Model A, which is this guitar here, and these two are Model A's. I call them Model A because uh, all of my wife's good friends call her A, and she sent me to Luthery School. <laughs> uh, so I named that model the Model A. Uh, so it's, it's the one that I drew and built at Luthery School. So I built that guitar once back in 1995, and it's that, the original guitar is still one of my favorite guitars. Uh, and then I went on a journey to find what was going to be the Gilmore guitar. So that was just moving lines until I found a body that I liked. So the standard is that guitar. So this became the standard Gilmore guitar. And uh, I'm a little guy, so I build smaller body guitars because dreadnoughts always felt big and bulky in my arms. So I, I wanted to build guitars that I wanted to play first because uh, I figured if I want to play them, you know, other players will want to play them as well. So uh, I went on a journey moving lines uh, and came up with the, the standard. And then I also build a standard jumbo. There's one in the case here. Uh, there's actually the one hanging in the shop is a standard jumbo. Is basically the standard blown up an inch. Uh, the parlor guitar that I build, uh, when I first opened the shop, I had um, 
an early 1900s Harwood, New York come in and it just had mojo for days. It was just a cool, cool little guitar. So I traced the body shape. Uh, it was originally braced as a lattice bracing, which is just straight across bracing. Uh, I use my typical uh, 45 degree bracing pattern mm. for, for everything that I do. So my bracing pattern is sort of an homage to Jean Larivet, you know, going back to the beginning when I went, oh, somebody can build a guitar, mm. so. That, that one with the Brazil, Brazilian rosewood as well, mm -hmm. we had that in our shop for a bit. The, yeah. the playability on it was just amazing, and the sound and your pickup, I mean, the combination is fantastic. So this wood uh, was harvested pre-1950. So there's no paperwork on it. There's no proof of purchase. There's no, so it sort of falls outside of the, the CD, the, the city's uh, treaty agreement. So uh, if somebody were to purchase this, I would advise against trying it to take it into the States because you might lose it. Because the thing is, is East Indian rosewood is okay, but Br Brazilian is still, you know, you're not supposed to use it and sell it. And the test is destructive because you have to get sawdust no. and to do a pH test. Now, uh, average Joe uh, border guard, for the most part, isn't going to be able to tell if that's Brazilian rosewood, granadillo, or East no. Indian rosewood. So this is something somebody would have in their home to play. Yeah. As they this, as they age. Yeah, <laughs> and, and this and this guitar it. it records fantastically. Yeah. So it would be a great little studio guitar. And that pickup you said was a boutique on as well. Yeah, and and again, MJS pickups says out of Mississauga, Ontario. I had saw that he had built one for another guy that was similar and I went can you do something like that but for a smaller sound hole because this sound hole is uh, only three and three quarter inches where a larger guitar you're up to three and three quarter mm. or four inches so a standard sound hole pickup wouldn't fit in this sound hole mm. and I really wanted the, the vintage sort of Diarman kind of look where it was open so he found a, uh, a mini Gibson uh, toaster style and uh, and handcrafted the uh, the nice. pickup so so it's a standard acoustic pickup uh, which is a low z pickup uh, that you can plug right into your board uh, and get really nice tone it's just a passive sound yeah we pickup. played it in the shop and yeah the plug-in on it too was just like really cool like yeah everybody just loved it so. yeah um, so the entire guitar you know the back the sides the binding the fretboard the bridge and the headstock veneer all came out of that that board of brazilian rosewood so uh, and that was the last of the stash. So we were talking about tone woods. So uh, Timeless Instruments out into Tagaski, Saskatchewan, is now uh, a North American dealer for Tasmanian Blackwood, uh, which is fast becoming uh, a desired tone wood for acoustic builders. It's uh, it's relatively new in in the acoustic guitar world as a tone wood, but it bends really nice and it's got really really nice tone. And obviously, it's it's a very very pretty wood as well. So it's uh, it's not cheap. It, it's it's in the you know East Indian rosewood sort of area for a price for a set of back and side woods. So so uh, I bought this at a guitar show from from Dave at Timeless Instruments. Uh, probably the last guitar show before everything shut down. So that would have been the fall of 2019. So and I built with it. And I went. Oh, I'm going to build with this again for sure. So. Mm, that's beautiful, beautiful graining on it. And uh, I, you know, there's all kinds of alternatives. This is Paduke. So you get sapwood and lots of color, lots of variation in the color. 
So, so Paducah is an African wood as well. We also talked a little bit about neck finishes. Yes. Which interests me and as different players that we, you know, ask in the shop. Yeah, they, the, they the conversation the we're having about the feel of a neck, mm -hmm. and uh, we had mentioned that it's, it's really a preference. And some people have very sweaty, acidic hands. So on a glossy finish, uh, as the, that finishes get, gets really warm, it tends to start feeling sticky. So some players will just sand that, that high gloss finish off the back of their neck or they just won't purchase you know, a glossy neck. So it's, it's really a personal preference. Um, so you can have a high gloss finish or you can have just a, an oil finish that feels almost like you're touching wood, but it's still protective of it. And it, it's, it's very easy, your hand slides nice and easy on mm. it. So, uh, and the feel of that, like I said, you can feel that. Yeah. It's, it's called a close to the wood finish. Mm. And it, it feels like you're, yeah. you're touching wood. Yeah, for sure. But it's, it's very protective, like you can't scratch it with your fingernail. Okay. So. Yeah. Nice. So yeah, uh, some people have very acidic sweat. Uh, we were talking, I had a customer who's moved to the States now. Um, he would come and play guitars and he would ruin a set of strings in five minutes. I would yeah. have to, every time he picked up a guitar, I would have to replace the strings. <laughs> but it was okay. He was a great customer. Clint Wissinger, you know, he's got seven Gilmore guitars. So, yeah. you know, all you play, all, play all day. <laughs> so. Cool. Uh, this guitar, yes. again, like I said, I, I like to, to use and reuse. This wood was harvested from the Jack Daniels Distillery in Lynchburg, Tennessee. So I, I have a, an acquaintance here in town who's a cabinet maker. And uh, he bought a pallet of it from in an online auction. So what happens in Tennessee, obviously the, the climate is is hot and it was the wallboard and the flooring in the in the aging sheds and it starts to crack and 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 they have to replace replace it. Yeah. So they, they pull it down and resell it. So, uh, you know, hmm. I actually put the old number seven logo in the headstock. <laughs> With permission, of course. <laughs> uh, actually, I, I went looking and uh, I, uh, they have free downloadable oh, yeah. JPEGs, oh. right? So uh, apparently they're okay with you using their logo. They're not okay with you selling their logo. Yeah. So uh, it's there, it's a one-off. Yeah. And as I built this guitar, uh, I don't know if you've ever followed any of my socials like Facebook and Instagram, I'll post pictures of, of the progression of the build all over it. Mm -hmm. And every time I did this, I tagged, yeah. you know, uh, old number seven or uh, yeah. Jack Daniels. Not once did anybody from there contact <laughs> me to say, hey, don't do that, or that's pretty cool. Yeah. We'd like to have it as part of yeah. our collection. So oh, that's, that's it's cool. here and it's for sale. Yeah, nice. Um, you've got a podcast too you've been working on. I've I do. It's called Live at Gilmore Guitars. Yeah. Um, because I did, I did radio for 30 years and 15 years on the air, then 15 years doing, doing sales. But one of the things I was really good at uh, when I was on the air was the artist uh, interview. So I, that's one of the things that I sort of brought from, you know, my previous experience is the nice. podcast. So I've got a studio set up. I've got really good microphones. I've got a good interface. And uh, the, how the podcast works is singer-songwriters will come in, do four original songs, and I'm selfish, so they play one of my guitars on the podcast. I just send yeah. them in here and say, pick a guitar. Just play yeah. them all and... And, uh, that's cool. And if somebody's interested in the guitar, they can hear how it was played. Yeah, and, exactly. And uh, so, yeah, that's nice. Good idea. So I, I recently did uh, Susie Vinnick, who won, who's won probably 10 or 12 Maple Blues Music Awards. Mm -hmm. She's been nominated for three Junos. You know, she came in and fell in love with this guitar. Huh. Uh, you know which episode that is? Uh, it's the last one last that, that's up right now. Yeah, okay. And she just played with uh, Morgan Davis. Uh, at the Elks here last last weekend. So on Sunday, I had Morgan Davis come in uh, and do a podcast with him, and he loved the bark <laughs> of the little because uh, cool. he's a, he's he's a journeyman blues guy in Canada. Yeah. He yeah. actually he he jammed with you know Muddy Waters, and, <laughs> and you know his 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 hero was Hubert Someone. So 
So he played this guitar on the podcast, and it's going to uh, go live tomorrow morning. Nice. Because uh, I wanted to give the Susie Vidic one yeah. a, a bit of time. See to, a new one coming yeah, out every so, well, I, I'm kind of at the mercy of availability, no, yeah. so it, I would like to say, you know, I'm doing one or two a month, but, yeah. you know, some months I'll do three, and then sometimes I won't do one for two yeah. or three months because, you know, uh, availability. Yeah, it's, so. it's interesting, too, because you've got, like, however many followers you have, mm -hmm. it really doesn't matter mm -hmm. that one or, one or two or 80 or however many people, yeah. they're still they get to know who you are and yeah. and through that it it's yeah. grows so it's part of your entrepreneurial journey and it's yeah. cool good for you That's yeah i mean the whole podcast yeah. thing it's it's a selfish endeavor yeah because i get to watch people write you know singing songs that they wrote on guitars that i built and yeah. you know just sitting in the room and watching it is gratifying <laughs> let alone recording it and letting you know the whole world nice you know the internet <laughs> world see it uh yeah. the, the podcast actually has done pretty good i've it's almost up to 3,000 downloads. Wow, so, sweet. so it's okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's all process, right? Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you. Uh, was there anything else you want to uh, give no, us one of? I'm, this beauty in the corner. Uh, that actually doesn't <laughs> you built work. that, Dave? I did not. I have <laughs> built one similar to it, uh, but I did not build that one. That one belongs to uh, Scott Barnaby. Uh, I think it's still here because it looks good in the corner. Yeah. Um, uh, you can see uh, all of these posters on the wall. Um, my old location was down in uh, Riverside Light Industrial. It was a shop twice the size as this one, and I was able to hold house concerts out. Oh, cool. So all of these people played in my shop. You know, one of the, the joys was having Kevin Walsh play in my shop. Just <laughs> an, a, an amazing singer-songwriter. Uh, these, these ladies f from Australia... I'm huge fans of their work now. Mm -hmm. uh, Don Ross, Callum Graham. Callum Graham was voted one of the best guitar players under 30 years old a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and he's from High River. Wow. Yeah. Uh, the cross stitch on the wall, my mother did that. Ah, nice. So if you back up, it actually looks like a photograph, but the closer you get, you can see that it's cross stitch. Mm -hmm. Nice. Cool. Well, thank you, Dave. Appreciate right. it. Thank and, you. Uh, I appreciate you coming we'll in and doing We'll keep working with you, and we'll work awesome. together any way we can. Perfect. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Welcome back to another episode from uh, Westlake Grill at Heritage Ranch here. Um, what we have going on today is we've turned our uh, front little pasture here. You can see we've got some horses kicking around, but we also have our electric fence set up and we have our garden set up there. Um, the cameraman Graham there has worked very hard on that garden over there. We uh, it looks like squash, zucchinis, pumpkins, melons, garlic. You name it, it's coming out of there. It's a little test run. So right now we're giving some to the restaurant and giving some away to whoever wants to pick some up. I think those are all, that's all been uh, distributed. Um, right now what we're doing though is we're picking some potatoes. Picking potatoes from our potato towers. Uh, we built about, what, 20 something of them? And uh, yeah, what we found though is these bad boys would work really well in your backyard. I have one in my backyard. Um, basically what we have is a layer of straw. You go about a foot or more and then you load it up with uh, compost and dirt, uh, manure if you have some. 
And then you plant your potatoes and you start getting, see here's the potato we planted. And look at that, that's pretty good. Oh yes, mother load. All right. We have the, uh, like a chicken wire fence. I think it's 80, what did we do, 80 inches I think? of uh, chicken wire and then we roll it up like this and then we just hook it in hook it in just like this right and then we can come around and hook these now what we're going to do is we're going to open this up and these ones what we're finding right now is the ones with straw topsoil and a little bit manure have produced the best potatoes that's what we've found so far everything else like look at these bad boys oh yeah and we're going to leave this mesh here so it can kind of catch potatoes catch everything so like look right here, look at that, perfect. Look at that beauty. All right, so I'm just gonna uh, try to push this over and see what we can find. Oh yeah, look at that. Perfect, oh yeah, we got a lot here. Yeah, so we're doing some experimenting, seeing what works best. Uh, I think for next year, we're gonna be leaving all this soil here, going to be making a building basically a higher bed on top of this with doing less ground disturbance right regenerative agriculture is kind of what the goal is we got the horses uh, once these potato towers are all dug up and you know, it's all cleared out we'll let the horses come in here eat the grass get knock it all down and then um, then after that we'll uh, use this soil here maybe do a couple tills just to get the you know roots lifted up of the of the weeds and stuff like that because it's a pretty weedy area and then we'd set it up so that the beds are a bit higher. And then you could walk in between and have higher beds for the potatoes. Now for the tomatoes, you can follow me. You can see here, this is what we did here for tomatoes. So all we did, and these ones are ready to pick, and they're, a lot of them, I think I started late this year for my tomatoes, because they didn't really come in till uh, a little late this year, and we had a cold snap. So they kind of died. But we got a lot of them, but could have got better. And I just let them grow this year. There was a couple that I had trimmed up at the bottom here. And then like if you take off a lot of this stuff and you plant them, they grow a lot bigger. Like we had one standing up, up to, you know, whatever, however tall that is, four feet, five feet. So, and I mean, these ones turned out pretty good. Probably taste one, make sure they're not. Mmm, yum. Mm. So what we did was this is compost right here. So I just took the rototiller, tilled up a spot, and laid down some nice compost. See, look at that. So then all we did was plant it in there, put that up, and let it grow. Next year, I'll make sure we trim them a little more so they can grow bigger, and then you get bigger tomatoes. We got a lot of tomatoes out of this here. It's a nice, easy way to plant tomatoes if you have the room. You don't really need to make a whole row and till up a bunch of stuff and make extra work, right? Just, you know. I bought two yards of compost, I think, for 17 tomato plants. The tomato plants we did already, so they're all pretty much down except for a couple here. And then hopefully we can grow this. Expand it each year. And uh, the whole point is, is to get uh, the more fresh vegetables to the restaurant, the better. Uh, the high, higher quality. Like those tomatoes are delicious. Super fresh. Those potatoes, potatoes I grew, those uh, rustic potatoes at my house as well. And... Uh, fried them up the other day They're really good so we'll be serving these in the restaurant I'm not sure what chef will use them for but we still have I've only done two towers now and I still have all these towers behind me um, yeah like I said we'll let the horses roam in here and then get it prepared for next year just thought we'd uh, give you a little tour of what we're trying to accomplish here you know farm to table freshness um, and just a lot less uh, a lot less emissions just a you know, we have the community around here too. I hope to get someday get them all involved. We live in uh, West West Lake here, so hopefully someday they'll we can get them involved with gardening and make a community garden or something. It's kind of my vision in the years to come. But for now, it's an experiment to see uh, what we can grow and what works best. So yeah, thanks for stopping by, and we'll see you around. Cheers.